Okay, welcome to our weekday text gathering. Today is day 106 in the Circles reading schedule, and we are discussing chapter seven, section one, the law of the kingdom in the complete and annotated edition of A Course in Miracles. You can find this on page 263. While not the main thrust of this section, I happen to love the discussion in paragraph five on the four freedoms, which we don't have time to address today, but I hope that you'll read it. I am commemorating today's section with my four freedoms mug, which was supposed to be a set of four, but I jokingly call it my two freedoms mug because in the shipping process, two of the mugs arrived broken. The uh, four freedoms are the freedom of speech, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom of worship. And this mug is freedom from want. It comes from a series of paintings that Norman Rockwell did to commemorate the freedoms. And again, I know that we're not covering this today, but I just happen to personally love that Jesus mentions the freedoms because they were instrumental in the creating of the United Nations. And um, as Robert wrote in his footnote, Jesus siding with the freedoms aligns him with a, a deeply humanitarian vision of the world. And, uh, and I love that, but we already knew that about Jesus, didn't we? <laughs> Reminder once again that you can find the reading schedule, recordings, handouts, and access links for these gatherings at circleofa.org forward slash text gathering. Again, please be sure to share that link with anyone you feel could benefit from coming together in this way. These gatherings are free and all are welcome. And we can only offer these gatherings and copies of the course and course companion scholarships to those in financial need through the generous uh, contributions of our donors. So if you feel inspired to donate to this work, we welcome any gift that you feel moved to give at circleofa.org forward slash donate. So please take a collective breath with me. and bow your head in prayer. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to come together today as loving friends and mighty companions on this remarkable path of light. We surrender this gathering to you and ask that it serve your purposes and be blessed by you. Dear God, we ask that you remove in us any blocks to the awareness of your presence. May we learn to think like you so that we may be led to the highest vision of ourselves and one another. As it says in this section, God of healing is the only kind of thinking in this world that resembles yours, then let us be healers. Help us to look out for each other. Teach us what to do, because only that we will to do. We ask all of this so that we may be a source of miracles and healing within this group and within the world. And so it is, amen. Amen. Okay, well, we are in chapter seven, section one. I'm really glad you mentioned the freedoms, Emily, because I'm not going to be talking about that, as you know, uh, in the class today, but it's such an important paragraph. It just says a lot about where Jesus is coming from to support FDR's vision of the four freedoms and yet to explicitly criticize the idea that we should have gone to war for them, which was a lot of the impetus for going into World War II. I mean, it's really telling the whole thing. Okay, let me share my screen here. We talked a lot about them in the Senselessness of War podcast series. Yeah, and then also there was the, in this recent Circle News, we sent out that article that Greg and I wrote some years ago about the freedoms. Right, I forgot about that. Do you remember the title of that so that people can look it up? If they, like, just do a like search we have the, the answer article. or something like that? Like, Okay. Yeah. Search for freedoms in the article archives. Yeah, it. yeah, it should come up. bigger. Okay, the thing I want to focus on in this section, which is really part of the main theme of the section, is not so much the law of the kingdom. He talks about a law of mind that operates in the kingdom, which in the course means in heaven. 
But he also talks about how that law gets translated by the Holy Spirit into a law of mind in this world. So let me go ahead and read the passage here. Outside the kingdom, the law which prevails inside it is adapted to what you project or extend you believe. This is this teaching form. Because outside the kingdom, teaching is mandatory because learning is essential. This form of the law clearly implies that you will learn what you are from what you have projected onto others and therefore believe they are. Now, in these classes, you hear me talk about this law in one form or another a lot, just because the course talks about it a lot. This is just bedrock for the course all the way through. In different language, the law is given different formulations, but you can see they're, they're basically, you know, the same idea. So what it means is that here on earth, you project onto others, resulting in what you believe they are, and then this teaches you what you are. And there's a few things I want to say about that. First of all, we're, we're constantly trying to teach ourselves what we are in a direct fashion, you know, telling ourselves what we are in different forms, whether those are based on spiritual principles or just normal, you know, worldly ways of thinking. We're constantly trying to tell ourselves what we are and shape our image of ourselves and then also shape our image of ourselves based on you know, our trappings in the world, our accomplishments, our possessions, our appearance, et cetera, et cetera, who we know. But what this is saying is that the law of mind is that you really teach yourself what you are based on what you choose to see in others, which is a bit of a sobering thought. And I'll say more about that. But the thing I want to say before I go on to the next category is that he's very clear, this is a law, okay? And a law, like think about laws of nature. You know, in our conventional thinking, you can't break a law of nature. And the one that I always bring up in this context is gravity. And I do think that those laws from the course's standpoint are not ultimately laws, but just in terms of our normal thinking, you can't break the law of gravity, okay? Because it's a law. And it's the same with this law of mind. You can't break it. So no matter what you think, no matter how much you think that seeing somebody as beneath you elevates you, that's not how this law of mind works. If you see somebody else as denigrated, you'll see yourself as denigrated. Okay, so the next category says, you can apply this law in two ways, resulting in two different outcomes. And the quote I have here says, the outstanding characteristic of the laws of mind as they operate in this world is that by obeying them, and I assure you that you must obey them, you can arrive at diametrically opposed results. Notice that little aside there, I assure you that you must obey them. That's not the kind of language that maybe we associate with spirituality. Like, you know, you have to obey this. Um, a lot of us got into spirituality to, to escape that very kind of language. But when it comes to the laws of the universe, that's just the way it goes. You have to obey those laws. You don't have a choice in the matter. Okay. So, Whatever you project onto others and therefore see in them, that is how you'll end up seeing yourself. And as he's suggesting here, and we'll see an example in a second, you can do that and get completely opposite results. How? Well, you can see other people in, as lower than you, as you know, full of ego, as unspiritual, as unethical, um, as dangerous, untrustworthy. And the result is then that's how you'll see yourself. Or you can see them as elevated, as your equal, as 
containing immense value as ultimately being divine, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you'll see yourself. But what I just want to point out here is that in the, you know, so much of the focus on the spiritual path in self-help and psychological circles, motivational circles is working on your self-esteem. Well, what if this is the biggest determiner of your self-esteem? What if this explains the real story behind any low self-esteem you might have? Right? What if all those attempts to elevate yourself by seeing others as lower than you, beneath you, inferior to you, um, more sinful than you, et cetera, et cetera, what if those ultimately drag down your view of yourself resulting in low self-esteem? That's a really interesting possibility. Okay, so... Let's go on to the example I have, which I just thought was so applicable to our situation in the world right now. I mean, I, I look at those tables all the time of how many are infected, how many have died. This is from the first part of the section. When a brother perceives himself as sick, he is perceiving himself as not whole and therefore in need. If you're not whole, that means you're lacking. If you're lacking, you're in need. If you too see him this way, you are seeing him as if he were absent from the kingdom or separated from it, thus making the kingdom itself obscure to both of you. Sickness and separation are not of God, but the kingdom is. If you obscure the kingdom, you are perceiving what is not of God. To heal, then, is to correct perception in your brother and yourself by sharing the Holy Spirit with him. This places you both within the kingdom and restores its wholeness in your minds. I'll kind of draw that out in terms of two options in just a second. But what I think we have to understand, first of all, and I think most of us do, it was when the Course is saying someone's not sick, it's not saying his body isn't sick. It's saying his essential being isn't sick. So throughout the Course, and this is um, a huge theme later on in Chapter 28, but it's the theme all over the place. It's a major theme in the Course, is seeing other people who are physically sick as not being really sick. Yes, their body's got something wrong with it. I mean, everybody has a lot wrong with it. Um, but their body has something we would call sickness. It's our job to realize that's not them. That's not their actual identity. That's not even real. The body is what the Course calls a dream figure. And who they are is completely whole and intact. And so the Course is asking us to, I think, have a somewhat bigger mind that can incorporate these two different elements, right? I mean, the human mind wants to simplify things and like, okay, what I see in front of me, that's the person. And the Course is asking us to have a larger view in which, okay, yes, the body is ill but that's not who the person is. And while acknowledging the bodily condition, I'm going to see and affirm and relate to who that person really is. Just so we're clear that when the Course says, don't perceive someone as sick, it's not asking us to engage in some kind of really pathetic denial. Okay, so there's really two options that you see in, in this passage. Option one, you see your brother as sick, not whole, in need, and that means absent from the kingdom. And the result of seeing him that way, according to how the law of mind works, is you make the kingdom obscure to both of you, and then I think we can add what, what wouldn't be implied by the discussions of that law, 
and you see yourself as sick, not whole, in need. So choosing to see your brother as sick ultimately means you see yourself as sick. And this even takes place on fairly specific levels. Um, Jesus in some personal guidance to Helen and Bill about psychological testing said that when they administered a psychological test to someone and saw that person as having a particular mental illness, if they believed in the reality of that mental illness, they'd experience that same illness in themselves. And I don't think that's too far, too hard to understand. Because for instance, um, you know, I was a psych major in school and it's a classic thing where you go to, you, know, you, you, you take abnormal psych and as each new thing comes along, each new mental illness, you think, gee, I think I might have that <laughs> or I have some of that. That's not so different from, you know, I see this person as having this mental illness and, and while I'm making it real in that person, I'm suddenly seeing at least some of it in myself. Um, so this is all, I think, in line with our experience. See somebody You're doing else's. that now with the coronavirus. Every yeah. scratch in your throat is yeah. some fair weather of a future illness. That's a good point, because I've been doing that. I know, that's why I brought been, it up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I swallow, I think, gee, it's, is that like a normal feeling in my throat? Do I always, I'm not sure it isn't. Yeah, Finally, we're all just, doing uh, that. Forget it, forget it. You know, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, so, and that's a direct result of making it real out there. That's a good point. Yeah, okay. So option number two, you share the Holy Spirit with him, seeing him as filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the result of that? You heal him, the Course says, to heal the to correct perception in your brother and yourself. You place both of you in the kingdom. You see yourself as whole and abundant, meaning not in need. And the course abundance is an inner condition, not an outer one. So this is so applicable, right? While we're, you know, we tend to see the whole world as sick right now. And, you know, there's, there's pretty obvious reasons for doing that. But we can make a choice to say, yes, a lot of dream figures are sick, but I agree with God in realizing that that's not who those people are and who they are is eternally whole. And that's where I'll put my focus. Even while I do whatever needs to be done in acknowledgement of the physical facts. So I want to do a little exercise um, in just a minute, but uh, before I do, why don't we have some discussion? Did you want to say anything, Emily, besides, you know, pointing out my, Various <laughs> issues. <laughs> You're not alone. That's the reason why I pointed out everybody's doing the same thing right now. Well, this section brings up the issue of compassion. How are you present to the needs of somebody who is sick while also not seeing them as a body? And Jackie is um, commenting here on her son and he is an alcoholic, unreachable, untouchable, and she wants to extend love to him and see him through the lens of this section and the course as a whole, but feels hopeless for the healing of that relationship and wants to know if there's any recommendations you would have to help her in that situation in her life. Mm. Well, I think all you can do, Jackie, is just hold that vision of him uh, as not only being whole, but as being capable of making choices in that direction. And then really ask within, you know, how, how can you express that? And can you express that? Um, I think both of those things are, are really important. Um, you know, it may be that you just respect his boundaries um, and you just work on the inner level. And it may be that there's some creative way, you know, uh, a message, a gesture, something, you know, who knows? But the Holy Spirit's got some kind of plan for an ideal 
response to him. And you can contact that. And Robert, I'm glad that you brought up the concept of self-esteem because we are obviously steeped in the teaching that low self-esteem is about a lack of confidence and being afraid. But what if, because the law of the kingdom is what we extend is real for us, our sense of unworthiness comes, as you said, from seeing others un as unworthy. And that puts us into a place where we're attacking them. And then you can kind of extend that. What if that's not only part of our own lack of self-esteem, but it's also part of what's making us sick too? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And where, where have we been taught that? As Everywhere. you say that, it's, well, I mean, where are we being taught that our own sense of vulnerability to sickness, our own sense of low self-esteem comes from how we're choosing to see them? Like, I don't hear that voice anywhere, except for in the Course. Right. And where are we not being taught that our lack of self-esteem comes from the fact that we're just low confidence and we're afraid? So right. it's a whole complete reframe to think maybe I'm not confident in myself because I'm not, I'm not judging myself as worthy because I'm not judging other people as worthy. Right. And then if I say, well, my own lack of confidence comes from now I finally realize I got treated by in this way by so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so in the past, that's more dumping on others, which according to the course, according to this law, drags us down even more. Mm -hmm. yeah. Kathy says it's a brilliant reframe on where the lack of esteem comes from. And you're right. You don't hear it anywhere else except and, the course that I know of. Same here. And if it's a law that you can't break, then we're chained to it no matter how much we're thinking we're oper operating by different laws. And doesn't this just emphasize the need for course-based psychotherapy? Because how many therapists are out there trying to combat the epidemic, the other epidemic of low <laughs> self-esteem with tools that are just about trying to pump up the ego, like go out there and achieve more when really how healing would it be to say, okay, let's take a look at how you're judging others because that's going to come back on how you see yourself. Yeah. You know, in the psychotherapy supplement, he basically says not that therapists offer are offering that kind of solution, but he says patients are going into therapy seeking that kind of solution. Mm, yeah, it's a really good point. That's why we hire coaches. Yeah, okay, Any, anything else? Just one more question from Sue. How do you feel, uh, not entirely related, but if you can answer it quickly, how do you feel about pre-birth choices that are made either for our own spiritual growth or for others? Didn't that get, brought up yesterday it did yeah yeah so it's a, yeah. It's a fascinating topic um yeah i i totally um believe in pre-birth choices myself there is a reference in the second paragraph of chapter three in the text to them um and i think there's two ways to see them one is seeing them as a sort of a conscious process that was done for setting up your life in this lifetime for the sake of certain lessons. And I think another is just the gravity of our ancient ego, which wants to set circumstances up um, basically to reinforce our ego, to, to punish us for past sins. I suspect both of those forces are, are going on. But there is in the CE now this one explicit reference to that more conventional idea, which I think is personally I think is true. Did you say where it was in this? Evening? Yeah, it's, it's in chapter three. It's the very second paragraph in chapter three. Okay. Sorry, I was reading the comments. Before we go to the exercise, I'll read this one from Savina. She says, this teaching is so good and helpful for me. I am a life coach and a ministerial counselor, and I do use uh, as best as possible, of course, principles in helping clients heal. Thank you, Savina. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, That's that is great. great. We need more of you. I have, I have, fallen into in, in trying to help people over you know the course of my life i've just so easily fallen into that thing of i affirm you by 
talking about how mistreated you've been by others. It's so easy to fall into that. Yeah. Okay. So let's go ahead and do the exercise here. Probably help if you close your eyes. So begin by thinking of all those who are sick now. And particularly of people you know who are sick or know of. And say to them, collectively or focus on a certain person. Okay, you can choose to say it to them all collectively or to choose somebody who's particularly known to you or important to you. I deny that you are truly sick. I see the Holy Spirit shining in you. I see you as whole. I see you as inside the kingdom. Let's go through that one more time. And if you said it collectively, you might want to think of switching to an individual. If you said it to an individual, you might want to think of switching to the collective. Okay. Let's pick a focus and go through it again. I deny that you are truly sick. I see the Holy Spirit shining in you. I see you as whole. I see you as inside the kingdom. And now on the basis of that, turn your attention to yourself and say, I must be like you. I must be whole as well. The Holy Spirit must be shining in me. I see both of us inside the kingdom. I see all of us inside the kingdom. That felt really good. Um, I liked the collective. I don't really know anybody um, personally who's who's infected, but I liked the uh, feeling of like not seeing the whole world as sick. Yeah, it's easy to feel that way. So this is a excellent yeah. reframe. Chris is saying, what if we use lesson 199, I am not a body, I am free, and set it for the person we see as sick, yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, 
We have a lot of comments here and we have seem to have run out of time. Um, uh, Jeremy, we're using a different edition of A Course in Miracles than what you have. Yes, we use the complete and annotated edition from the Circle of Atonement. You can find it on Amazon or at circleofa.org. Uh, I assume you're using a different version than we are. Okay, but I think that's it. Um, Sure? Liliana says, my entire body just had a buzzing through it. Can't explain. John says, that feels great. Good. Mm. It's nice to hear wonderful. that you're having these responses to the exercise. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, Robert, some of what you were saying about um, being inside and outside of the kingdom and how, how we view uh, others reminded me of the quote where it says, um, other people's I'm paraphrasing here, but other people's transgressions are sins, but yours are errors that in all fairness deserve to be corrected. In that encyclopedic head of yours, can you tell me where to find that? Because I think that's something that's relevant here too. Yeah. In the way in which we view others. That's chapter 27. And it's now in the CE, it's like section three. It used to be section two. Um, yeah, while well, yours and fairness should be overlooked. Yeah, because we've been talking about how to discern real guidance from the ego. And, and I, I loved what you said about real guidance would never tell you the other person is wrong. And so I just feel like if we can get into that mode of, of viewing everyone charitably, then we know that we're on the right path. Right yeah, but real to, guidance can tell you somebody else is in error. In error. In my experience, guidance will do that. But not sinful. But not sinful. Right. right. Yeah, and that is in section three of chapter 27 now, and it's paragraph four. Right. So, okay. In the CE. I, yeah, I feel like we could go on about this for a while, but we should yeah. go ahead and end it there. Thank yeah, you, everyone, sure. for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing to you see here you tomorrow. All again. It is great to see you. I will unmute everyone so that we can say goodbye to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.